So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this morning in this session, which I'm told is the most subscribed session for the morning, which is really exciting to hear. Um, part of that may have to do with a group that I'm hearing that you're setting up led by Ed, the International Funders Group through the um, Southern California Grant Makers Association. And so this session, Sustainable Development Goals, a global framework for addressing poverty, inequality, and the environment. Um, I think everyone on this stage is probably calling it the SDG session because that's sort of the way we think now. Um, but it's something that we want to get you all involved in, talk to you a bit about something that we're all really passionate about. Um, and so I just want to start sort of going back to this video for a moment. And I know that all of our speakers will touch on the MDGs and SDGs and focus on it shortly. But um, the exciting thing about having you all in the room today and the possibility of setting up an international um, group is at this historical point in time. And last month, the Sustainable Development Goals were agreed to by UN member states. And the UN member states isn't just the UN, it's the countries that we live in or where we're from. So just to give you a very brief synopsis of the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, and the Sustainable Development Goals, um, just to sort of reiterate what the video has said before I hand over to our speakers. So the Millennium Development Goals, they were eight development goals, and they were set up by the UN in the year 2000, and they were set for a 15-year time frame to reduce poverty. Then... We worked towards those goals, and three years ago, I think it was June 2012, um, the global community, including the UN, started thinking about what next. We're coming to the end of coming to the end of the year 2015. The Millennium Development Goals are going to end. We've reduced poverty, but we still have a long way to go. So, at that time, the UN, its member states, and philanthropy, civil society, and the private sector got together and started to create these sustainable development goals that you see today. So we have 17 goals, and this time they're universal. They're not just to developing countries, they're universal. So the US is a country with the, in which the sustainable development goals relate. So with that in mind, I would just like to ask you to think about three questions during this session. The first question is, do you think that your organization worked towards the Millennium Development Goals? The second question is, do you think your organization will work towards the Sustainable Development Goals? And the third question is, how many people do you actually think are in poverty right now and will be on January 1st when we start the work on the Sustainable Development Goals? So I'd now like to introduce to you our excellent speakers. I'm very lucky to have worked with two of them at different points in my um, career, and two speakers who I haven't met before, but I've been reading and watching all of the great work that they're doing, and I'm really excited to hear from them myself. So next to me, we have Tony Pippa, uh, the USA, USAID Special Coordinator for the Post-2015 Development Agenda. I think I got that right because it seems to change a little bit at times. No, At the State Department, sorry. Uh, Ed Kane, Vice President for Grant Programs of the Conrad and N. Hilton Foundation. And Kennedy and Jessica Odede, hopefully I've pronounced that correctly, from Shining Hope Communities um, Organization. So first of all, I'm going to hand over to Ed to tell us a little bit about Hilton's work and the role of philanthropy in the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren. Uh, you know, this is really an exciting moment for me because I've been working on this agenda for a number of years. Some of you in the audience know that. And to see a, a gathering like this at Southern California Grant Makers is very heartening because when, and I think um, Jessica, uh, they, I don't know if you were at that um, Global Philanthropy Forum, when I was speaking to a UN colleague who said, you know, this was only about four years ago. Did you notice something missing from the dialogue at the Global Philanthropy Forum? And I said, the Millennium Development Goals, they're coming to an end. No one's talking about the great progress that we've made over the last 15 years since the Millennium Declaration. And we got to thinking, you know, we've got to get philanthropy engaged on this issue, because philanthropy has an awful lot to offer. So here we are in 2015, 
as we are about to launch the, the Sustainable Development Goals. <clears throat> and I think philanthropy is poised to make a, a very important contribution. And I'm very heartened that the uh, Southern California grant makers and you um, feel it's important enough to come in have, and be a part of this discussion. Um, you know, I, I'm going to be a little provocative at the outset and just make the remark that um, the world's in a pretty nasty place right now. I was just listening to a talk by Jeff Sachs the other day, and I, and I entirely agree with him. He says, the, we're not on a sustainable trajectory. When you look at the inequality issue, you look at the, the poverty issue, you look at the climate challenge we're facing, you look at the population growth issue, the, we have some daunting challenges ahead of us. Yet, the good news is that those challenges can be addressed if we can all work together in addressing them. And that is what the Sustainable Development Goals are, are all about. For those that um, aren't familiar with what I call the UN silo, there's the philanthropy silo, but there's also the UN silo, a very exciting drama has taken place literally over the last 40 years. You can go all the way back to the Stockholm Conference in, in uh, 1972, which began to address these issues. But it was in a fairly dysfunctional world. We still were in a world of competing paradigms. The Soviet Union existed. And, um, but nevertheless, the issues were beginning to, to be discussed. In 1992, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Rio Conference on Environment and Development really started to uh, articulate the agenda. Uh, the, 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 uh, it was called the Earth Summit. And then the, in the ensuing 20, 25 years, a number of global conferences took place which articulated what we need to do in all the various areas to make human condition, to improve the human condition. And this culminated with the Millennium Declaration in 2000, which led to the Millennium Development Goals. And those goals were kind of cobbled together in the back room, as the story goes, um, but nevertheless, uh, not highly participatory, uh, but nevertheless, they did help focus us on a few core issues. Um, missing from those goals were issues that the Sustainable Goals now embrace, like the environmental agenda, and I would argue, um, the issues of governance, rule of law, strong institutions. So we have a much more holistic agenda kicking off in, in 2016. So that's how we got to where we are now. This just didn't happen overnight. This is, there's been a lot, but, but the, 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 if, if there's any criticism about the process, it's that it happens in these international fora among diplomats like Tony and others, and, and yet we, in our splendid isolation here in Southern California, are totally oblivious to this. And we, we've got to break down those barriers, and, and this is what this meeting's all about. So just down to the practicalities, what does this mean to us in philanthropy? All right, philanthropy has been absent. It now is getting more engaged. Um, I think we have a very critical role to play. Um, the, uh, the thought is that this agenda that's set for the next 30 years is going to cost $3 trillion. It's a daunting number. How are we ever going to do that? Well, we're not going to do it with philanthropy because we're a drop in the bucket in those terms. But if we can mobilize the marketplace, if we can make smarter ODA, uh, and we can join in and play a catalytic role in making that happen, I think that's a sweet spot for us. We also feel that uh, we can help with convenings um, at the various levels. The real rubber hits the road at the country and community level. So we have taken it upon ourselves to join with the Foundation Center, the UN, UNDP in particular, um, Rockefeller Philanthropic Advisors, and two other foundations, the Ford Foundation and the MasterCard Foundation, to create what we're calling, for lack of a better term, philanthropy platforms in uh, countries and countries that we've piloting these programs are Ghana, um, um, Kenya, uh, Colombia, and Indonesia. And all of those platforms have taken place. They've been very well attended by the full range of stakeholders, government, civil society, international organizations, bilaterals, and philanthropy to discuss how can we all work more effectively together in, for in the case of Ghana, where we've been for 25 years, making sure that by 2030, every Ghanaian has access to a sustainable and safe water supply and sanitation. I mean, that, that challenge continues to elude that country, and we've been there for 25 years. We know we can't do it by ourselves, but we think we can do it in this more collaborative approach. So um, there's a great deal of literature that has um, developed over the last um, um, few months based on these platforms. I'm not going to go into depth. I'm seeing Lauren waving to me over there. Um, but, um, but I would ask you to you know, check it out on the website, um, sdgfunders.org. 
this is just an example of, uh, for the first time, there's now a document that tells you what philanthropy is doing in Ghana. If you're working in Ghana, you wouldn't have known this before until this platform was developed. And it's through the good work offices of the Foundation Center that are beginning to collect this data so that we can begin to leverage each other's efforts much more, better, much, uh, more effectively in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. So I think we have a little video on the SDG philanthropy platform that we just want to show you all. Um, so if we can play that now, I'll just give you a bit more information. And it's a, obviously, Ed says, a way that philanthropy can engage in the SDGs. Philanthropy translates from Greek as love of humanity. Modern philanthropy is constantly evolving with innovative ways of giving and growing rapidly in developing countries. Philanthropy has the resources, scale and potential to greatly contribute to international development. The Millennium Development Goals have succeeded in pulling together resources to tackle the most pressing social issues. Most foundations worked independently from the MDGs, yet the key lesson learned is that multi-stakeholder partnerships can accelerate progress on the goals. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It's time for action. We're at a pivotal moment for global development, where philanthropy has a critical role to play. The challenge is big, and the stakes are high. Sustainable development goals apply to all countries, with a series of ambitious targets to end extreme poverty, fight inequality and injustice, and tackle climate change for everyone. By 2030, partnerships are essential to achieving the SDGs. It requires all people to be involved. We need to look at the big picture. Who is doing what? What resources do we have? At what scale? In this ecosystem, where are you? Where do your interventions best fit alongside other foundations, policies, and organizations? The SDGs offer a shared vision for our humanity, coordination of efforts, shared measurement, and open communication. The SDG platform for philanthropy is a new partnership effort between the United Nations Development Program, Foundation Center, and a group of leading foundations guided by the Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors. We have our partnership efforts in four countries, Kenya, Colombia, Indonesia, and Ghana. We facilitate collaborations that advance SDGs, including SDGs 4, 6, 10, and 16. Kenya has a thriving philanthropy sector and is experiencing rapid economic growth, but inequalities continue to exist, especially for youth. Kenya Vision 2030 aims to transform Kenya into a prosperous and globally competitive nation. In Kenya, we contributed to creating Kenya Philanthropy Forum, a space for philanthropy to collectively address common interests, women's empowerment, youth employment, financial inclusion and education, and skills development. The platform stgfunders.org is an open source website that captures philanthropy data from around the world and provides insights and roadmaps for better engagement, collaboration, and partnerships. It's time to take action. It's time for partnerships. Okay, so I won't talk much more about the platform now because you've seen the video, we've heard from Ed, and I'd also like to thank Ed for sticking to time. Shaheen and I were a little worried and my watch also stopped this morning. <laughs> so that concerned me a bit too. But um, just quickly on the platform, if you've got any questions about it, reach out to Ed, Shaheen, the other Hilton colleagues in the room, or myself, and also take a look at the website sdgfunders.org. As the video just outlined, it actually uh, tracks grants against the MDG, so we can see where the um, funding flows have been going and the money's been spent. And we're also going to do the same with the sustainable development goals, actually starting, I think, in two weeks' time, we're going to start crosswalking this data. And eventually, the site will also, we hope, be able to track progress against the sustainable development goal indicators themselves. So... <laughs> With that, I'd like to hand over to Jessica and Kennedy Odede. I understand Jessica was named the US top world changer 
if I've got that correct, which is very cool. And Kennedy was named in the top 30 Forbes social entrepreneur list. And their work actually relates directly to uh, goals three, four, five, and six, I believe. So it'd be great to hear about um, your perspective from civil society and how it relates to the SDGs and your work. And also really happy to hear about the work in Kenya and hopefully we can work on that together as well through the platform. So thank you. Thank you so much. And I feel very happy to be here. I want to just share a little bit what we are doing and how. So I grew up in a big, big slum in Africa called Kibera. And there was no running water <clears throat> in object poverty. Uh, and we don't have government schools inside the slum. At the early age of 10, I ran away from the house and I became a homeless kid eating from the garbage because there's no hope. There's no basic needs, you know? So for me, it was a very, very frustrating life. Uh, I, I never knew there were some UN goals in, in our life in Kibera by then. And I was really wanting to change my life. So it was a very tough life for me to see what's happening in my community. So what I did was that I was able to get a job in a factory earning uh, $1 for 10, for 10 hours, a tough job. And I bought a soccer ball to, inv to bring my community together, to make a movement on how we can solve this big problem in our society. You know? And that's how to give people hope that they can change their life. That's how Shedding of Community was formed. And I was able to meet Jessica, who and I have been able to work as a partner and to bring services to my community, whereby women were being uh, abused and gender inequality was a big issue. So right now we have a school for girls that is centered around social services in my community. And I think what our work, so we, we work in the slums of Kenya, in Kibera, where Kennedy grew up, and in another community called Mathare. And we're building a model of connecting girls' schools to a holistic ecosystem of services, so healthcare, clean water, economic empowerment programs, putting girls' education at the center and starting with early childhood education. So for, focusing on child development from literally infancy and then beyond. And what we've seen, I think, is that there is a need for civil society to be part of the conversation about both the MDGs and the SDGs because I think that there is, there's so much progress that's been made with the Millennium Development Goals and yet in the very poorest communities, they haven't achieved the same progress. And so while there has been great progress made globally, in Kibera we still see so many kids not enrolled in primary school, so many kids not matriculating, not having access to preschool and, and beyond. And so that is really what our work focuses on, is closing that gap and being a provider. And so we'll serve over 76,000 people this year and are taking this model of girls' schools connected to services and growing it. And I think there's a lot of potential for the work of the SDGs to come in and say, here's the gaps, and then there are different sectors and different levels at which need to be filled. And one of those is really at the grassroots level. And in communities that are truly left behind, completely marginalized, realizing that there is more progress that needs to happen in terms of gender equity and in terms of really basic enrollment in primary school and beyond. So thank you to both of you. Um, I'm sure if anyone's got more questions on the great work that you're doing and Kibera, um, please reach out to Jessica and Kennedy. So our last speaker for the morning is Tony Pippa and Tony and I actually worked together previously on moder modernising official development assistance, which is another financial tool to funding the sustainable development goals. So I'll hand over to him to hear about the perspective of government and also his involvement in creating these development goals. Thanks, Lauren. So before I get started, just before we started this conversation this morning, how many folks were aware of the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs? Ah, that's good. Oh, great. Especially coming from Southern California Ranchers. Um, and then, have he you heard that. of the SDGs? People in the audience are really <laughs> Um, and how many had heard of the SDGs or the Global Goals? Uh, 
All right, well, we're starting, to, we're starting to do our job. So one thing I would say as the difference between the MDGs and the SDGs is the amount of public attention that we've been trying to give and the awareness raising about the, um, about the global goals um, from the outset to sort of build momentum for implementation quickly. So it was great to see that show of hands and, and I'm really pleased to be here to be having this conversation. Also with many of you who are doing funding just in your local and, and regional area. Um, uh, I'll try to make three points as to what the opportunity is, whether you're a funder that works globally or one that, that continues to be focused locally. Um, and that is there are, I think, three key aspects that I just wanted to focus on. One is the comprehensive nature of the SDGs. Um, the second is the universal nature of the SDGs. And the third is the inclusivity uh, of this process and what it can mean um, as we go forward. So one, just the comprehensiveness, and, and uh, Ed mentioned a, a little bit about this, but the MDGs were very, um, were very siloed in a way. Uh, they were eight goals focused primarily on developing countries, and they're what I call uh, sort of the, the cornerstones or the building blocks, a first order of business for where developing countries uh, might want to get to. They were focused on reduction of extreme poverty, of uh, preventable child deaths, preventable maternal mortality. The SDGs um, are more a full foundation for development that is relevant to any country. Uh, they're really about root causes than they, are, than they are symptoms, and they take a systematic look. And that means they have issues of equity and inequality and economic inclusiveness as well as environmental sustainability that's a part of them. And so the relevance is to any community or to any region or to any country. And I think that's a big change. That means we have a lot more goals. We've gone from eight to 17. We've gone from 21 targets to 169. That seems to be overwhelming, but at the same time, that is comprehensive. And, and that's what we need to be about if our communities and our countries are going to uh, get to what, the, what we were aspiring um, through the goals. Um, they do incorporate things like peace, justice, rule of law, very strong focus on gender, uh, gender equality and gender empowerment, and a, a particular theme of the SDGs is leave no one behind, which means that the poorest and the hardest to reach should be those that are prioritized and focused on first. Because the MDGs were global aggregates, they actually hid progress or lack of progress among some groups um, that Jessica was just talking about, as well as some countries. So the comprehensive nature of the SDGs provides a real opportunity. Secondly, they are universal. Um, and uh, that means they apply to all countries. This is not just about developing countries or frankly resources going from developed to developing countries. This is about collective action worldwide and what the world itself aspires to. In some respects, it's the highest ideals of what you could get through a multilateral body like the United Nations. And the US was extremely active in shaping this set of goals. Um, I would say that the, the priorities that we have both domestically and internationally for development are reflected in these goals because we took such a constructive and active part in them. And contrary to the MDGs where the US actually took several years to come on board and actually fully embrace the Millennium Development Goals. Um, the president at the summit where the goals were adopted four weeks ago unequivocally uh, committed the U.S. to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. And I just want to read his remarks when he committed to them on the universal nature uh, because it is something that he committed the U.S. to applying internally as well. He said, all of our nations have work to do. Here in this country, the wealthiest nation on earth. We're still working every day to perfect our union and to be more equal and more just and to treat the most vulnerable members of our society with value and concern. So normally, and, and I worked at USAID before going to the State Department to help negotiate these goals uh, through the UN. You know, I'm talking with colleagues at the National Security Council and, what, and, and this being a pillar of foreign policy. But in this particular context, we've also been talking to the Domestic Policy Council. And in fact, the Domestic Policy Council is taking this quite seriously and has looked at all the goals and the targets 
and how they might apply to the domestic agenda of the U.S. government and where the initiatives look like. Um, and we're going to continue that conversation, and we're going to continue to think about what would the U.S. say and how will we report and, and what will the data show about what our progress is on the, uh, on the global goals for sustainable development. And then lastly, inclusivity. Um, the Secretary General, and, and I don't know if there's a counterfactual out there, called this the most inclusive process in history to develop these goals. This just goes beyond that particular tableau, and it needs for there to be resources from philanthropy, from civil society, from the private sector, from businesses, um, and we need to put that, those partnerships and that puzzle together to be successful in the aspirations. But I will say from our experience of the MDGs, the experience of global goal setting and collecting data that is rigorous and internationally acceptable will really, really provides a platform for the conversation to happen at a different level. And so I think that's the opportunity. It's the opportunity if you're a local funder to think about how your focus and, and your priorities and the data that you're collecting align with these goals and what they might, uh, how they might align with action that's happening, whether at the federal level or at the, at the city level, to try to, uh, to achieve these goals. And if you're a global funder, how it, uh, how it syncs up with, uh, with, with action um, that countries are taking to be able to achieve the goals. Thank you, Tony. And thanks to all of our fantastic speakers. So I'm going to try and sum up these excellent remarks. I don't know if I'll do them justice, but we'll try and touch on some key points. So philanthropy has a critical role to play here. Everyone is in this room has a critical role to play. And philanthropy is essentially, the way I describe it to a lot of people, is another, another tool in the toolbox of how we achieve development outcomes. Uh, we've heard about the SDG philanthropy platform, which is a way for philanthropy to work towards achieving the SDGs. Uh, we need to keep in mind that the goals are cross-cutting, comprehensive, universal and inclusive. And I think, uh, I was saying this to Tony earlier, there was one point where we were almost accused of being overly inclusive in this process, so I guess you can't win. Um, there's a need for all stakeholders to be a part of the sustainable development goals, philanthropy, civil society, government, private sector, academia. And there's a huge opportunity to make progress and shift uh, the paradigm. And most importantly, I would say, <laughs> there's a huge need for data to achieve the SDGs. And without the data, it's gonna be very hard to measure progress and see what we're actually doing and see if we're making a difference. So thanks to all of our excellent speakers. Uh, we're now going to turn it over to our huge and fantastic audience and take some questions. So if you could uh, raise your hand if you've got a question, uh, introduce yourself, and if it's directed at a specific person, please mention that. Otherwise, we'll decide amongst ourselves who's the best person to answer that. And there's someone walking around with microphones. So we have a hand up over to over here, two hands up, in fact. So keep your hand up and the microphone will come your way. Yeah, <laughs> everyone keep thinking about questions in the meantime. <laughs> Now's your chance. Um, hi, my name's Lori Fry. Uh, I manage grants for the Charlize Theron Africa Outreach Project. And my question is rather around connecting, obviously, in our specific areas, a lot of times the, plat the, the funding has plateaued, but obviously in collaboration with other people, we can really make the money go a lot farther. And one of my questions about is more about the capacity of the people who are doing the work at the lowest grassroots level, like really in the weeds. And because their capacity isn't so much that they can report the data and um, report in the way that they need and, and do the monitor and valuation that they need, their, it limits their ability to actually get larger funding and bigger funding and upscale and things like that. And so my question is how do we then, like as funders we can obviously fund capacity building, um, but I see a gap in what, what you guys are talking about at the, at the policy level and then actually getting those resources to the ground to organizations who can actually report at a level that is needed to have those conversations. So I just wanted to kind of get your guys' take on that. Great, thank you. Maybe we'll take uh, one other question at the same time and then we'll sort of do two at a time, if that works for our 
panel members? So the first question is around uh, filling the gap on capacity, essentially. Hi, good morning. Um, Beatriz Solis with the California Endowment, and um, thanks for a really wonderful conversation and um, really lifting up the framework. Um, in a lot of the investments that we're making here in California, we see that a critical component to policy systems change and everything that you've addressed in, in your work is really critical. So I think it may build on the previous question, which is we know that power um, is really important and developing that level of license and agency among populations to really be the you know, the actors in that space. And so just wondering how you see that fit. Um, in that, it seems to be a little bit clearer about women and girls in terms of leadership and power, but it also takes, um, you know, in, in terms of what you talked about, like youth and youth license and agency and opportunity to see themselves as those agents of change um, in community. So just wondering, um, you know, what ideas or best practices um, that you've seen um, from the implementation of this. Great, thank you very much. So we might uh, discuss these two questions first and then we'll come back to another set of questions. Uh, just on that last question, it's actually interesting because I've been thinking about the same scenario of agents for change and ambassadors for change. And I actually think in this region of the world, you're almost better placed than anyone because you have Hollywood right down the road, and you've got great people doing great things that are well known and can help drive the agenda as well. But I'll hand over to our panelists, um, and I think there's something that probably everyone can touch on here. Perhaps Jessica looks like she might want to start. Great. Well, I think to your question about capacity and measurement, I think one thing that we've seen, I mean, it's a very grassroots organization start working in the communities. Uh, we have 260 local staff um, from the communities we work in. And one thing we really started to think about was how do we, as a grassroots organization, measure our impact in a way that we can actually play a role in conversations like this? Because otherwise, without that data, it's very difficult to be able to contribute. And so what we've been able to do is to give every single one of our users an ID card with a scannable barcode that actually becomes a source of empowerment because many of our constituents don't have a government ID. And on this ID card, we're tracking where people start and we're storing all of this data in Salesforce. And so we can pull up at any time who used our water by level of education, gender, employment status, and we're actually able to track what's happening. And I think what, what surprises me is that the innovation and the idea for this came from the community themselves. And so I think oftentimes the conversations are just not um, happening in a way that people on the ground are able to contribute their ideas as stakeholders, but those ideas really do exist. And so it's about capturing that potential and then being able to innovate around that. And so now we're able to really measure and see what's working, but from the very basic, most, uh, most direct grassroots level. Ed, and then Tony, perhaps? I mean, we've, we've achieved quite a lot in identifying the 17 goals, the 169 targets. We're, there's now an exercise underway to actually look at indicators and, and how, what are we actually measuring, um, and also, um, you know, who will do the measuring, the metrics that will be applied. Uh, I don't think, I, I think we need to be clear from the outset that although these goals, 193 nations came together and, and uh, articulated these goals and targets, these are going to then be brought down to country levels, and I don't, maybe the word customized isn't the right word, but integrated international development strategies and, and where the different priorities among those goals will be set by governments, and then we would hope that it, even down to the community level, they will then also have mechanisms in place to, to um, uh, determine what the priorities of a particular community is. Uh, but the, and in terms of the metrics and data, fundamentally important issue, uh, I think that's one of the areas where philanthropy can play a, a role. Uh, I, I, I believe it's in our um, mind that the platform, that um, we're, the platform, the pilot platforms that we've helped develop, will be looking at that issue and looking at where the capacity constraints are, particularly at the community level, and how we might be able to help um, in, in um, getting robust data. Uh, just to uh, I, uh, to continue the the conversation on on data. Um, 
there will be data, as, as Ed was mentioning, sort of through the official architecture, and there will be indicators that the UN creates and that countries uh, report up through uh, at the global level. Um, but there is an enormous opportunity to leverage data that's not coming through official government systems, um, especially in areas where, where the statistical capacity actually in governments or in cities is, is not as rigorous and as robust as we would like. Um, the U.S. has been part uh, with others, philanthropy and other countries in launching a global partnership on data for sustainable development. And the hope there would be that you would actually take models um, that, that we were just talking about up here, uh, bring attention to them and, and think about how they can be scaled and how they can be applied in other areas. Um, and, you know, with technology and with the amount of data that we're awash in, there are probably opportunities to leapfrog what the constraints and capacity are, but we have to be smart about that. Um, and we have to look at where the investments are to, to be able to make that happen. Just to comment a little bit on, um, on power and, and the importance of power, I really think that this agenda, because it did focus so strongly on reaching the poorest and hardest to reach first, and because we fought, um, many of us fought to ensure that part of this agenda really uh, created space for multiple stakeholders. It's not just about country. The MDGs were very much a country agenda, uh, but the, the sustainable development goals really um, affirm the necessity of citizens themselves, actually, to, to be part of this, and for civil society to play a strong role in what accountability looks like. Um, I do think uh, that, combined with what's in the goals and targets themselves, provides a, a platform, if you will, um, for there to be real agency um, at the grassroots level and among populations and groups of folks who um, are traditionally marginalized. Uh, and just to go beyond, uh, as Ed was saying, to, to go even deeper than the national level to the subnational level, um, this, you know, th this, this agenda does allow countries to integrate this with their development planning, but it also recognizes and affirms that things are happening not just at the federal level. There's a goal on cities, for example. And in fact, New York just put out a one NYC plan, which is a sustainable development plan that they, that they tried to align with the sustainable development goals so that the indicators and the measurements of progress that they would be using for their own city um, can, can roll up and, and comment and inform what progress looks like uh, for the U.S. On, on the SDGs. And so the opportunity is there. Um, again, it's a pretty much of a comprehensive blueprint, and, and any cities or regions or localities can use it that way. Thank you all. Luckily, we've actually still got a decent amount of time for questions, so let's take another two. Uh, is there anyone over two over here? Perfect. It's nice that everyone's clustering together. <laughs> Um, this is uh, Brad Myers from the Conrad Hilton Foundation. Um, so I'm a believer in all this, so that's the framework here. Uh, however, because I'm a believer, um, I'm a little concerned about the counter-argument to all this, because as this is being presented, it's hard to see how anyone could disagree with this approach to addressing poverty, inequality, and the environment uh, without being sort of relegated to the uh, class of people who are backward or ignorant or somehow not with us, you know. And so, and that's fine to do, we do that all the time, that's what humans do, but if we, if that's the only response we have is to sort of label people as backward who aren't with us, I, I'm wondering um, what, who's, who's losing out with this? I mean, the fact that these goals, either this was, and it may in fact be, it may have been one of the greatest achievements in diplomatic history, to get in this relatively short time to get these nation states to all buy into this, it's incredible. But it leads me to believe that they're definitely winning or they wouldn't have signed on. So who's losing is my question. Provocative, I like it. We'll take one more question and then we might turn to the other provocative person in the, in the panel, Ed, to answer that. <laughs> but we'll take the sec second. Job, so. <laughs> Hilton might be hiring. <laughs> Hello, St Steve Hilton, the Conrad Hilton Foundation. This is a question to Tony. I would, I would not be so crass as to ask this question, Tony, 
but I've heard other people raise it. So only in, in the interest of sharing other people's opinions, some say that the United States government, you know, especially USAID, often has more than a humanitarian goal. It's, um, you know, partly at least a political goal. And I would assume there must be some tensions between how do you balance the humanitarian side with the political side within this SDG framework. So to whatever extent you feel comfortable responding, I'd be interested. Okay, so maybe Ed, Tony, and Jessica and Kennedy, if you want to drop in on these questions, but let's start with the provocative one. Well, well since both the questioners are, one is my boss and the other is my subordinate. <laughs> uh, Answer very carefully. And, and, and I can have this dis and, and I can have this discussion offline with them. I'd, I'd rather turn it over to Tony at this point. Fine. We'll take that. Uh, on the tensions between the humanitarian and, and the political side, um, certainly uh, it's a balance actually that aid has to deal, U.S. aid has to deal with in some respects daily. I mean, we are part of the foreign policy apparatus of the U.S. government, um, in, and yet uh, the, the, the focus uh, is really to um, reduce poverty worldwide. Um, in fact, you know, one of the reasons why the U.S. was uh, so active in the, the design of these goals, the, the president has signed the U.S. up now, three years running in the State of the Union address, to uh, be a leader in helping end extreme poverty worldwide. And uh, although this is a comprehensive blueprint, I would say ending extreme poverty is still the moral center of this particular agenda. Uh, it's the very first target under the very first goal. Um, and it's now part of USAID's for mission statement, for example. And the other part of that mission statement is about building resilient uh, democratic societies. And the integration of rule of law, good governance, peace and justice and what that means actually for the ability for development to occur um, is something that uh, we were we fought very strongly to ensure was part of this particular framework because it was part of the first ever presidential policy directive on development which happened in in this administration um, and that governance uh, really is a cross-cutting issue and a basis for any development to occur anywhere and in fact, when I talk about domestic um, application to the SDGs, we did a, an event in New York, in the summit where we launched these goals, um, on the issues in goal 16, which is the, the goal that, that combines peace, justice, and good governance. And we actually had someone there from the Domestic Policy Council, Roy Austin Jr., um, who talked about, and in fact, we launched a presidential memorandum that day on access to justice in the United States. Um, and so it's really interesting how these narratives start to combine. Uh, so I'm getting a little off topic on, the, uh, on, on how aid balances the humanitarian with the political. Um, just to say that at, at the country level, it's something that we, we have to be, manage and, and deal with every day. But one of the reasons why we were so active in the negotiations on this particular agenda, I think is because we feel as if there are key building blocks that are political, actually, to development, and we wanted those to be represented and reflected in, these, in this particular set of goals. As to who's losing, frankly, we were naysayers, even though we were active and constructive, um, we thought that there was a lot more rigor that could be brought to the, the, uh, the targets themselves underneath these goals. Um, we, want, we see this as a platform for mobilizing action, and the MDGs, because they were very specific, really provided that platform. If, if you understand, if you think about innovative partnerships like the Global Fund for AIDS, TB, and malaria, you think of the, the Gavi Alliance for Immunizations, those came out of the MDGs and it was because there were very specific targets that we were shooting for. Two-thirds reduction in preventable child deaths. Three-quarters reduction in maternal mortality. 
Um, that gives you a platform for really putting partnerships together and, and bringing private sector. They can get their hands around that. You can get philanthropy, can get their hands around it. Here's what we're all driving toward. Um, we were worried, frankly, that we weren't specific enough through this particular agenda to galvanize action at that level. And I think there's still a question mark as, as we pivot to implementation. How will you prioritize things within the agenda? How will we be concrete and practical enough? And frankly, um, 193 countries came together through a sometimes extremely frustrating process to come to consensus. And it's an extremely politically optimistic moment to come to that consensus. But frankly, the credibility of the UN and the multilateral system is still, I think, um, uh, it, it will be reflected in how well we do on implementation over the next 15 years. Um, and so I, I think there's still a lot of work to be done and I think we ought to celebrate the consensus that we've been able to come to um, but I think it's gatherings like this and it's in its communities such as philanthropy and others and how well we can we can mobilize action at the extent to really which we achieve the aspirations being put out where the proof will be in the uh, you know the the devil will be in the details and we'll, and we'll see what the proof looks like 5 10 15 years down the road can I just engage in just a tad bit of hyperbole here please you know I really think this is a transformative moment. I think we're in a moment in history, and we may not even realize it, but, but when those that follow us look back, hopefully we will seize the day and take advantage of really moving forward on this agenda. You know, you, I like to joke, you can go back to the Magna Carta in 1215 and cite that as a seminal document or the Declaration of Independence. I'm a big fan of the Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. And then, as I said, these ensuing conferences that took place. But this, to me, is a foreign policy coup by the United States government. That we are, we have in this, uh, this, this agenda, the kind of values, principles, and norms that we believe in as a society. And, and I think we should be very proud. And Tony was part of the negotiating team that got us to this point. When you look at, at goal 16, and some of, the, some of the naysayers say, well, you know, it doesn't blast out human rights, or it doesn't blast out um, uh, democratic um, institutions, but there's nuanced language, and if you read it in goal 16, and I'll read it to you, is promote peaceful, inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. This is where, this is a, this is where we in philanthropy can help leverage that language, and we can make it more precise and more meaningful in the different contexts that we work in. I mean, it's, it's, and it's a huge coup to have this, this governance issue finally put into the, um, the global agenda and embraced by 193 countries. I, I really think it's this important a, a document that, that we're dealing with, and we have a real role to play in advancing it. I, I think uh, we should not celebrate, because when I go back to Ghana, when I'm in Kibera, I ask people, what is MDGs? They don't get it. We have to change our way of things, radically, to be honest with you. And because there's no link between the grassroots and where the police is being made, you know? But I'm here today with a big hope. Why is the hope? When I was in Kenya, people from the UN could not come to Kibera. They're not allowed. And yet, they have to work on poverty. I think we are lying to ourselves. But the funders like you, people like Ed, was able to come to Kibera. They were not told not to come, but they were able to walk in. Larry and the rest, you know. So, but the solution is that if we funders, you are the one dealing with people on the grassroots level. If we come together the way we are today, I think we're going to make a big impact. But if we are just waiting for the UN, we're going to just be having these ideas, goals created that never really goes to the grassroots level. So for me, this is the hope. So Ed, I'm very happy. <laughs> Thank you. So we've got time for one more question, I think, and I say, oh, two. We can take two. We keep it quick and the answer is relatively quick. So there's two down the back here, I see. By Estes, I'm with the Santa Barbara Foundation. Um, I understand that USAID, GEF, the bank, uh, they work with a lot of local agencies that were listed under the original MDGs. 
And there's a lot of learning happening between ME practitioners at both ends. And capacity, if done well, is being built at both ends, whether at the larger agencies or the local agencies. International philanthropy, fortunately, as you mentioned in Kibera, are able to actually participate, actually learn and grow accordingly. For local agencies, for local philanthropy, for domestic philanthropy, where is there an opportunity for them to be incentivized and invest in m and &E and participate in that relationship? Because we've been dancing in the periphery for the most part. And where is it that we are incentivized to not only uh, collect good data, but align that data and report on that data and also allow that learning to occur at the local level? Great question, thank you. And in incentives are something that we come up against a lot lately and are becoming more and more uh, related to the discussion and around data, so thank you. And there was one other question down there, I think. Hi, um, I'm Gail Haberman with the LA County Department of Public Health, and we've recently released a five-year plan for improving health and equity in LA County. So I'm excited to look at your targets and to see how our 20 measurable targets align or don't align. Aside from that, I'm curious, can you lay out a vision for how, a vision or just advice for what we do with these targets in LA County or any local county? Aside from just looking at the targets and adopting them, what processes do you think need to happen to embrace these fully? Uh, what's the ideal implementation look like? Another great question, thank you. So who would like, Ed, perfect. Don't want to put him on the spot again. Well, as, as Tony said, the, these goals are universal, and they and and we're grappling with this in our foundation right now. This has principally been a uh, an engagement with the international community, driven by our international team. But uh, we all has have a very um, robust uh, domestic program uh, addressing chronic homelessness, substance abuse, uh, foster youth, uh, and so we're looking at how can we use these goals to leverage those um, activities. And I think there's huge opportunities. Um, we um, have, some of you may be familiar, uh, funded a project called Measure of America, which applies the Human Development Index methodology to measuring human progress in this country. And as Tony also indicated in his remarks, many of the 17 goals relate to quality health care, quality education, um, poverty reduction. We have almost 20% poverty in this country, just below 20%. And, and, the, and the, the largest demographic subgroup in that is children. Um, so we think that we need to come together and, and try to develop a common um, metric along the lines of the Measure of America, which, by the way, devolved into a Portrait of California report, which is looking at the human condition throughout the state of California and that if we can periodically produce those kind of reports and hold policymakers, decision makers accountable for progress, um, perhaps along the metric of the human development targets, uh, this, this could be a real, um, um, this could really move the needle in terms of, of, of seeing progress. I think that, you know, one of the roles of philanthropy is so, maybe uniquely able to fill, to Kennedy's point and to Ed's point, is that philanthropy can be nimble and can come in and sort of fill in the cracks and work with partners on the ground and then also join conversations like these, conversations at the policy level. And so I think that philanthropy can actually be a bridge in a lot of way. And metrics can play a role in having those conversations and having those conversations feel credible. But that there is something about, and I think philanthropy beyond the roles philanthropists can play um, can also bring partners together. And something that we've seen where, as part of the, the Hilton Network is in Kenya, we meet and come together with the other organizations that are funded by Hilton and talk about what we're doing. And so best practices and, and topics actually, I think, kind of build on each other when philanthropy both convenes partners and also serves as a, as a nimble force to reach places that perhaps policy can't. So I, I think those are the right questions and they don't have easy answers. Um, part of that is that they're questions that then require further conversation and, and further coming together around. And I know, for example, that the Council on Foundations is thinking of hosting conversations with local funders in, in several cities just to start to, to share ideas on what 
the application of these global goals could mean in local areas for funders that are focused locally and what the incentives are. And I think the incentives question is a really important one. What, what's in it for what impact um, can look like at the local level from, from these universal and global goals? Having said that, a couple of things that are very powerful about these goals is that they're focused on impact and results at the outcome level and not necessarily on inputs. And so, um, and then they are not just comprehensive, but they're also integrated. So they, they really um, affirm how uh, interventions, for example, to make progress on health, it's not always a health intervention that, can, that helps you make progress. I mean, we know, for example, that um, girls going to school early and staying in school longer correlates to lower rates of HIV AIDS, for example. And, and, and malnutrition is not just about food security and, and getting the right nutrition, but it also has impacts on health, education, economic activity. And the goals and the way these goals are put together really reflects that. And I think what New York City did, actually, um, in putting their one NYC plan together was to try to take a comprehensive, integrated look and approach at where they might go as a community rather than it just be, you know, health and the plans for health and, and silos going forward. Um, the other thing that I think this really does is provide a platform for sharing and lessons learned that goes far beyond how did something work well in another part of the country and might be able to be applied here? How did something work well in another part of my state and might be applied here? I mean, talk about good things coming back around again, but you know, in the, in the mid-90s, USAID had a plan, had an initiative called Lessons Without Borders, where what, what was happening well overseas, uh, they took to particular cities to share learnings back and forth um, to, to bring best practices to, to bear on some of the US's most pressing problems. And in the city of Baltimore, by using social marketing uh, techniques that um, had, had happened in Kenya, the city of Baltimore was able to raise its immunization rates from the low 60% to over 95% and became one of the highest rates in, in the US at the time. Um, the, 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 break, the universality of this agenda and the breaking down of sort of borders, both in terms of subject areas and also in terms of the differences between countries or the differences between regions, I really think offers an opportunity for lessons learned and for sharing, which philanthropy is extremely well positioned to bring knowledge and application to bear on. And so I would just keep that, uh, keep that in mind as an opportunity as well. Thank you to our excellent questions, the audience and our speakers. I'm just gonna quickly wrap up and then hand over to Ed. Uh, in order to wrap up, uh, earlier I asked you to think about three questions throughout the session, which you probably have now formed some answers to in your mind. Um, the first question I asked you was, did your organization wor work towards achieving the MDGs? And now I actually did a little quick sort of data crunch on this to show you the importance of data and also to show you what you're doing. And so of the 140 SCG members that Foundation Centre has data on, we have data on 42, and 37 of which are based in California. These 37 foundations alone awarded nearly 180 million in grants towards the eight MDGs between 2002 and 2012. So whether you know it or not, you actually already have been working towards the MDGs. So well done, and let's take it forward. Uh, the second question was, do you think you'll work towards the SDGs? Well, I think that's become pretty clearly ne clear now that Regardless, the SDGs are universal, so whether you're working in the US, you'll be working towards the SDGs, or if you're working in Kenya, you'll be working towards the SDGs. And the third question I asked was, how many people do you think at this point in time are in poverty? And at the moment, the numbers we're at are approximately 800 million people, or 12% of the population. So it's 12% of 7 billion people, and we've gotten to that number in the last 15 years because the rate was halved. Now, 12% is still too many. It's a huge portion of the population, but at the same time, it's lower than maybe we anticipated. And so 12% is a number that we can actually reduce and eradicate, and everyone in this room can work towards the SDGs and reduce and 
um, get to zero poverty levels. I think we can do that. We've got the skills, the resources, the expertise, the funds, and great interested people. And that's what it takes is to do this work. So thank you to everyone. Uh, let's see where we are at in a year's time. I'd like you to leave this room thinking about where you want to be in a year's time. Maybe this session will be a plenary as opposed to a breakfast, and we'll be talking about the next steps. So thank you, and I'll hand over to Ed, and also thanks to our excellent speakers. So very, very quickly, first let me thank SCG for arranging, um, uh, SCG, yes, SCG, SDG, SCG, um, for arranging this, um, this session. Uh, and as Tony alluded to, the Council on Foundation is really wrapping up, ramping up his uh, involvement in seeing how uh, the broader membership of the, um, of the National uh, Council can um, encourage Philanthropy to become more engaged, and, and we certainly welcome that. Um, I'm putting on my hat as vice chair of uh, Southern California grant makers um, to uh, advise this group that there are, that SCG is, is establishing an international funders group. We've learned that there are a number of funders that are looking for a venue where they can share experiences, talk about how they can work together, for instance, on the SDGs. Um, so th this is something that uh, we're very supportive of in the Hilton Foundation. We're a major funder of international programs, and we know that a number of you in this audience uh, are also in, in, in funding uh, international programs. So dialogues like this can continue in that, uh, in that funders group. So I would uh, encourage you to um, um, check that out with uh, Dave Sheldon or, of course, Chris Essel, and how you might get involved. And uh, Shaheen Kasimlaku, who is the director of our international program, has been very, very active in that as well. Um, and the other thing I'm supposed to announce is the SCG electronic survey. Currently, there's a survey. Uh, we'll, which, yeah. we'll hand it around, I guess, is sort of an email, Adele, and is, you'll is fill that, it in. Okay, is there a, so maybe you want to tell us what that's all about. Hi, so there's, um, we're going to be passing out, or we're going to be sending an SCG survey, and we're just trying to collect some data on where people are funding and what areas are of interest to them. So we'll keep a lookout for that. We're going to be sending a survey after the conference is over. Thank you. So again, thanks to everyone for participating today. Join the International Funders Group, and huge thanks to our speakers and audience.